Hepinize tekrar merhaba. HDV Mutfak Etkinliği. Hello. Once again, we are together with you for the HDF Kitchen activity. We are with Dear Takuit Tomasian and Levon Bağış. As we mentioned before, it's important for us to have you have an experience in the conference and we're trying to bridge the distance that is between us through different activities. In fact, this is about eating together, but also getting together, getting to know each other, converse, and being together. Therefore, it's important for us to have this environment together with you. That is why we edit this side event. I would like to introduce our guests today. I'd like to start with Takuit Olmasyan. Tomasyan was born in Istanbul, Yedikule, and has established a special bond with food and cuisine from an early age. She gained great success with her book, Shofran's Şen Olsun. In the book, she tells the memories of her friends around the table, the stories of her relatives by matching the dishes and recipes, as if she hosts her readers in her home with her sociable style. She works as a translator of cookbooks at Arash Publishing, and she also speaks at meetings with the theme of food and table culture. And I now would like to introduce Levon Bağış. Many of you already follow him. And today he will be moderating this session. Levon Bağış was born in Istanbul in 1980. He became interested in wine during his university studies in public administration. This curiosity has gradually become his professional life. Levon Bağış attended certificate programs at educational institutions such as the London-based Wine and Spirit Education Trust, London Wine Economy called Van, and reinforced his knowledge with the certificates he received. Between 2003 to 2009, he took part in the founding team of the new local conversations, which is one of the important work for the identification of Turkish cuisine. He undertook the consultancy of the Gastronomica project within SALT. In the 2009-2010 academic year, he taught at the, the drinking and drinking culture course as a visiting lecturer in the gastronomy department of Okan University. Levon Bush, whose articles are in Karaf magazine and Feed magazine, is also the article writer of Korean Shanskrabedia and currently writes articles in August newspaper. I now would like to connect to Levon and Takui. Thank you. Hello, I would like to start by thanking you. It's always a pleasure for me to be part of any event related to the foundation, uh, including such conferences. This is very exciting, as always. In fact, we're going through very interesting and weird times. In fact, uh, only a year ago, if we were told that we would be giving recipes on the screen, in front of the screen, and converse in front of the screen, we would just laugh at that. But anyways, difficult times create different solutions. I think the human being's adaptability to such challenging times is an important one. I can't forget the dumpling day, month day we had in the foundation. If the doors are open once again, I think we should celebrate that with another mo dumpling month event. Well, perhaps we could start with the following. We could talk about the, the theme of today's conference. Yes, I'm, I eat a lot, I like wine, and Takui cooks great dishes and talks about those dishes, hosts people at her home. In fact, Nayat's introduction missed a, a part. Uh, Takui created a genre, which is very important. There are many examples of that nowadays in Turkey, we see similar books and she is the creator of that founder of that genre i would like to pay respect to her and in today's event and the story we will be talking about today we see the following in fact throughout the conference there's a theme a main theme and we should mention something we're talking about food or kitchen here 
One thing to remember is that food is not only food. This goes for many things. People talk about football in those terms. That also goes for food. In fact, when we talk about food, we talk about something else. Especially in our region, cooking together. If we talk about that, in fact, we are sharing a different story. It's about coexistence. It's about appreciating that is different from you. People who are different. Well, welcome back, Takui. Thank you. I am also very happy to be with you here. There was a slight delay, but I hope we will not repeat that. We will be together for the next an hour and a half. We will converse about food, just like we're around the same table. I hope that it will be a very good event. Yes, let's ask what we're going to do today. Today, again from my book, Sofren's Channel Sun, we'll be cooking a seasonal food, palamut, or uh, bass. We will cook those. Well, in sep September, you'll find uh, bonito. You'll find some of the, that fish in other uh, months, but I don't like to freeze fish. And I, I do that with my fish uh, monger as well. So I prepared sea bass. But we could do the same with bonito. And there's a saying in Tur Turkish, even if my dad came out of the sea, I would eat him. Uh, the same goes for me. I would eat anything that would come out of the sea. And there's something about bonito. Uh, many people like that. Yes, I'm the sa I have the same approach, but I would prefer bonito over my dad. Especially if it's uh, larger. If there's a creator, uh, the uh, smaller version is created to be a bonito, the larger version uh, is created to be a turik, and the other one is created to be a uh, meze with bonito. We'll cook fish in the oven, and there'll be a very simple potato salad that will follow that. And in the book, uh, they are shared as subsequent titles. In fact, it's hard to distinguish potato salad from fish, uh, separated from fish, and vice versa. That's why I've included that as such in that order in the book. And in fact, it's a good recipe uh, to cook today and make it ready to be presented. That is why I selected that. Uh, could, could we start with the recipe? How are you going to cook it? Well, in order not to cause any delay, I started the, with the potatoes. I will boil them like this. We will boil the potatoes. And here is our fish. We will decorate it a little. I will start by cooking a special sauce for the fish. Here is why. We could put potatoes and chopped potatoes and onions and put, but they're not exactly, they don't exactly taste the same as they used to put it, doma uh, tomatoes. So we will combine them with spices and pour them on the fish that is going to be cooked, put them in the oven, just to make it a little tastier, just to diversify the taste a little. I will add a little bit of olive oil on the pan, start heating it.
I will chop the onions in larger pieces and as the olive oil heats up we will also be stirring the in the onions it's just making sure that onions meet the olive oil without getting heat, heated up or stirred so much And Yedikule used to be um, by the seaside when I was little. And my uncle's wife, Ankile, had many relatives who were fishmongers, fishers. So I'm not sure which was the case. Was it our home was smel smelling fish or we were smelling fish? Or was the fish smelling like our home? In fact, we used to receive a lot of fish right from the fishermen. It in a box. I'll talk about uh, what chavela means. In fact, chavela, that word is not used so much, so often these days. Well, a chavela is like a ba basket. Made of reed or any other plant. Uh, it had many sizes, a fisher um, and could use it easily they also used it to filter the content it's a type of basket and they also used tin boxes made for cheese or other things oil the content they were emptied of their content and hammers would be used so that they the, their lids wouldn't cut our hands uh, and two sides were made into handles and the fishermen would use that to put fish or we would use it as pots for plants. My dad used to like plants. Basil. geranium and we used to plant those to decorate in fact to go back to our topic fish used to be part of our home but this is no longer the case a lot has changed now that Costs are closed since the 60s. Mm -hmm. Fishermen have reached new dimensions. Fishing activities reached new dimensions and Marmara was used so, so excessively for fishing. We now see that we don't have as many fish as we used to have in my childhood so much that we could play with the fish. In fact, a fish is no longer a poor person's food. It is now worthy of a program such as ours. I add in a little bit of tomato, the sauce. I will cook onion with the tomatoes slightly I'll add pepper
green peppers. That is enough. This will cook a little. I will add in salt. A little bit of black pepper because we like the smell. And I will then place the fish on the tray. In the meantime, I will start heating the oven. I will put a little bit of oil on the tray. So now I'm putting a pinch of salt on the fish. So at what degree do you preheat the oven? A little bit over 180 centigrade degrees. I would like to keep it a little bit above 180 degrees. It's not turbo, right? Some Daphne leaves. Again, black pepper. I added some bay leaves now for the lemon. In the meantime, our tomato sauce is going to be ready as well. I will just put some on the tails as well. Now I'm putting the sauce, hot, the hot sauce on the fish and we're going to be putting it in the oven. So at our home, my father loved cooking fish. And he really loved buying fish and getting fish into the home. And my most enjoyable shopping experience is with a fisherman as well, because I have a lot to talk to a fisherman. But so to have conversations, then, yes, there is a very nice saying. If you'd like to eat good fish, you shouldn't really 
know about fish, but you should be, you should trust your fishermen because they have such an immense knowledge. In my childhood, my father used to shop, but I always saw the fish who were just flapping about for the one last time. And when I started to shop as a matter of fact, I couldn't really buy fish first because I just wanted to see the fish flapping about first of all. That is why I wanted to go to the Bosphorus as a matter of fact with my, uh, with my spouse in Tarabia going towards Bukdere. There are fishermen's uh, shops and they would have live fish in, in, in plastic containers and we would buy from them. But now I can't go to those places either. So for a long time, I just trust my fisherman and I always go to him. Even if I change neighborhoods, I still go to the same fisherman and the same applies for my for the place where I get my liver as well because these are foods that can go off very quickly because they contain protein as well that is why the best option these are perishable food items that is why you need to be a friend of the fisherman you need to trust him And it is getting difficult, as a matter of fact, to become friends, to make friends with a fisherman, because because people are just going to the shopping malls at the moment. And another issue is that I had to change my fisherman over the years, as a matter of fact, because in some areas I'm really sensitive, for example, but sometimes the fisherman is not really that interested. For example, if I see small blue fish, I'd never shop from that um, fisherman again because that means that they are not respectful towards their own livelihood because they feed their family off that livelihood, but they don't provide me with the good stuff. So... That is why I believe that they have to, first of all, care about the product that they're selling. And not only to allow, basically, the blue fish to grow and become um, um, bigger, but also because they're not respect respectful towards their doing. But if I, for example, come across any fisherman in, the, in Yeniko, for example, then the enjoyment that I get from that is 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 huge and also when you go to the butchers as well maybe that is the enjoyable part about shopping from a fisherman or from a butcher for example the whole experience starts when you actually step into the shop and talk about stuff for example I cooked mussels after a very long time at my home because we couldn't really find good clam. But we found a uh, good clam and I'd really missed it, I found out. And I really went back to my childhood when I ate it. So food always is a very important relationship. You, you have a very important relationship with food, and that is the most successful part about your book, as a matter of fact. Eating is not only eating, it's about your geography, your neighbors, neighbors where you live. For example, I think about back to the island when I eat, and you, uh, you are reminded of Yedukule when you eat. So, the Yedukule, when you were a child, what kind of a demographic... Um, situation was there in Yedikula when you were a child? Was it mostly like Armenians or Greeks? And 
how were the fishermen uh, in Yerikule when you were a child? I, you were cut off at some point level. Could you repeat your last words? So you're talking about Yerikule, and I would like to know about the Yerikule of your childhood. Who were the people living there? Was it the Armenians, the Greeks? What was the demographic? What was the demographics of uh, Yerikule when you were a child? Could you tell us about it? Yes, Yerikule for me is a sort of a holy neighborhood for me, as a matter of fact. Not to put too fine a point on it, it was like going to the church. Going to Yerikule for me, I call the uh, wooden house in Yerikule my home. But it's such a small, modest house, as a matter of fact. You would be surprised to see me that excited about that house. It is a very small, modest house, but the life that I had in there was so lively. I had such great uh, memories there. Even if I lived in a palace at the moment, I would still um, hanker after uh, that small house in Yedekule. Even the smell in that house was different. We had a lot of Greeks in our neighborhood, and they would say Samatya is Armenian and Yedekule is Greek. We had a neighbor, Dr. Zupa. It was a stone house. It's still there. The Imrahor Avenue, Genja R Street in Yedekule. Our house number was 17. I didn't go there for a long time, but it was still there. The apartment building, I mean, the stone house, basically, of Dr. Zupa was still there as well. Madame Fofa's house next to us was still there. And I hope for long years to come, I hope they're not really going to raise the appetite of the contractors. And I hope that bulldozers are not going to be demolishing those places to build huge, uh, tall rise buildings. Uh, Madame Tufo's husband was working in Hajibekir uh, in Eminönü and he was a candy master. He was the candy master of Hajibekir and at each New Year's Eve he would bring us he would bring us dessert and he would write the new year on that um, dessert. Madame Fofo, Madame Sayabi, all the neighbors that we have there, he would cook on Shabur for them on the last day of the year, and he would serve that hot. If it was delayed a little bit, Madame Fofo would shout after him and he would say you didn't send me down for, Shabu, uh, for this year and she would say as you know I wouldn't give you anything without getting my uh, fair share And he would write the year, the new year, on that dessert, and he would uh, ornament it with dry figs and walnuts. And he would also send that dessert to our other neighbor adjacent to us as well, the next door uh, neighbor. In 1955, on the 6th and 7th of September, as you know, the very painful events uh, took place. After that, gradually, the Greeks sold their houses, but very slowly, as a matter of very gradually, and they started moving away from Istanbul. In 1961, we didn't have any Greek neighbors anymore. The elderly had died, and the their offspring moved to 
in Thessaloniki or to Greece. And then we really felt lonely. A lot of our relatives were living in Bakırköy and they told us, you shouldn't just uh, remain in Yedukule anymore, you should come close to us. And it became harder for me to uh, live in that uh, wooden small house as a because there were a lot of problems. Um, there was constant uh, leaking and the wooden um, fixtures would go would rot. So that is why we had to sell that house and move into uh, Bakırköy in a basically a concrete apartment building. And uh, uh, and we, we resided in the Bilgi Sokak, very close to Surp Advadazin uh, Church, very close to Tavuan School. There was only one promenade in Bakurke at that point, but still, it was one lane uh, promenade, but we would still uh, get our fish from a fisherman who would fish there and move uh, the fish around the neighborhood in his cart. And the cats would go around him as well, so that the fishermen would strip away the bones from the fish and throw that onto the cats. The hardest season for the cats was the scorpion fish uh, time, as a matter of fact, because it was really hard to um, chew the bones of a scorpion fish. It's such a lovely story. It is not only about people who are hungry and waiting for the fish, as a matter of fact, but also the cats who were on the shore. And of course, the cats are having the most trouble at the moment in the Prince Islands. In the summer season, there's a lot to eat for the cats in the Prince Islands, as a matter of fact, because they would get food from the restaurants, for example. There are a lot of people, but in the winter time, they're really lonely. They're really alone. And... There are some people in islands, for example, who are um, feeding the uh, cats and dogs there. For example, in our uh, island, Heibeliada, there was a lady who would, it, it, each winter in certain intervals, would go, to, go back to the island to feed the dogs and cats there. So about the story that you told us about the Armenians and the Greeks, there are lots of different and stories of Greeks and Armenians living in Istanbul. But you mentioned the Vasily cake, for example, the dessert the, the, you mentioned. And it's like a yeast, a sweet yeast bread, as a matter of fact, without um, tying it up in a bun. But I know, for example, that when you go to the east, to Diyarbakir, for example, this east bread is not, it's not sweet there with gum. What we eat is more salty, savory. Did you have any other, for example, the, did you cook uh, foods or meals from any other cuisine at home, I'm wondering? For a long time, we also cooked foods from Chorlu Chatalja and Tekirda as well, because my two grandfathers were from Chorlu and their Wives were from Silivri, Ekirda. The, the mother of my mother they she had come from Chorley as well, but they met in Istanbul.
and therefore we were a family that followed its own sort of cuisine culture as a matter of fact because we hadn't really met an Anatolian uh, family my mother my mother's mother was from a uh, Chorlu and she would always say, if I find somebody in Cholu, then I would uh, marry my son with that girl. And also Partuk, my uh, uh, uncle, who was 15 years older than my mom, as a matter of fact, he sort of assumed responsibility for the home and acted as the head of the household. And again, he would say the same thing. An Armenian from Thrace, that's what he wanted for a daughter-in-law. And that is why we all came together in Istanbul. And in 1947, the, uh, the, uh, the son from our side and the daughter-in-law from an, another Armenian family married in Istanbul. When my elder brother went into Anatolia, as a matter of fact, and then he learned about, for example, Ichli Köfte, Kısır, Diyarbakır, uh, Bans. So we learned about these things in the 1970s. And we know much more about them, obviously, at the moment. But how I see cuisine is that I should do, I should cook what I know best, and the Diyarbakır ban can be made from the uh, from one of the girls in the Maragasyon family, for example, because they know about it. Because they would do that best, as a matter of fact, whether it's stuffed meatballs, ishli köfte, or something else. Because I don't think, I didn't think that it was my right to get into their affairs, to get into their thing, as a matter of fact. That's why I don't do it. I got so many recipes, but still, I've never tried a Diyarbakır ban, as a matter of fact. And what you're saying is really important. So all these regions, all these possessions... Are as a matter of fact, just a sort of a deception because it, it is not really important who owns that food because societies just make just small touches on the food. If you're talking about Istanbul, for example, you're talking about fish, and this has nothing to do with being an Armenian, uh, Greek, Kurdish, or Turkish. If you live by the seaside, then you just eat fish. Therefore, food isn't really limited by geography. And I was asking you whether you were cooking any other foods from outside of your culture, but in fact, the situation is that all the foods, all the meals are away from our culture and also within our culture. Because what you call Armenian cuisine, for example, stuffed clam, if we're talking about that, I mean, in Armenia, you don't have sea. In the motherland, in Armenian motherland, you don't have that. This is the type of food that you used to cook after you got to the sea. Therefore, there is no nationality of food, as a matter of fact. And also, food is such a unifying factor. And it gets into your life so fast. You were saying, for example, that in 1970s you were learning about kebab, all the Anatolian foods, and Istanbul learns about those, as a matter of fact, around that time too. The time when the first kebab houses or lahmacun houses, for example, were opened in Istanbul uh, corresponds with uh, the late 
1960s. Because they would say, for example, at the time, oh, our street is going to fill up with the smells of lahmacun and kebab, and didn't want that. But at the moment, for example, it is not possible to find the neighborhood without a good uh, kebab house. And it's a very important part of my life as well. I wouldn't call on Istanbul without those in Istanbul, as a matter of fact. Because in the same way that you can't really get Donar out from Berlin, for example, you can't do that to Istanbul either. If you ask a young child in Berlin at the moment whether uh, kebab was a German or a Turkish food, he would probably say German, for example. And people are saying the same things again. They would say, for example, Syrians are coming in. There are so many Syrians coming in, 5 million of them, 10 million of them. But... Nobody's thinking about, for example, that around 40, the Syrian people have great restaurants at the moment. I am also cooking hummus in my own restaurant as well, and I really like the stuff that is there. But I've seen in so many small restaurants, they have great stuff. And whenever I go there, I always think this is so good. This is so good that we're also getting that food. We also, uh, this is also becoming part of our life. I think we need to start enjoy these differences. And the place where you can start doing this is the is the is your dinner table, is your lunch table. That is the easiest way to show that when you get together, great things can occur. I mean, I'm not always all saying that you should eat too much, obviously, showing my own stomach as well. So how are the fish doing at the moment? It's very good at the moment. I can, in fact, show you. Looks very nice at the moment. I didn't really check the clock because it was great having a conversation with you and I don't like to be bound by the clock anyway because whenever the uh, potato is boiled and the fish is co completely cooked then I would know about it anyway so I'll look at the uh, potato at the moment we have uh, another 30 minutes Being conservative about food or is nonsensical as a matter of fact, and the evidence for that is potato. We just we've just eat, been eating potato, for example, for the past one hundred or one hundred and fifty years. Because the greatest emperors, for example, European emperors hadn't really had potato before. And of course, we got potato and all the rest of those vegetables that I was talking about when America was discovered, as a matter of fact. So all the stuff that we are fighting about, as a matter of fact, came so much after Looking at the questions in the chat box, uh, Palmini, Russian dumpling, and Kaiseri dumpling is written in there. For someone living in this region, this is a very important dish. I mean, I can't think of anyone who wouldn't, uh, whose appetite wouldn't grow. Uh, I see curry, I see mahalep, I see stuffed wine leaves uh, with stronger cinnamon, uh, Greek style. I like cinnamon and that goes really well with our cuisine. 
I'll I'll ask you Takwi. Um, people say sarma in Turkish, uh, but uh, that's something I learned only later. Uh, both wine leaves or other stuffed uh, vegetables like uh, zucchini or um, pepper. Those are all. Ashtian's Pinyan's book, books, in all the, those books, uh, they talk about dolma. They use the term dolma. And even older books, Ashtian's books, uh, use the term dolma even instead of dolma. So I think Sarma is a little bit uh, less close to me. Dolama is the right one, I think. In older cookbooks, really nice terms are used in older cookbooks. In Ashtun'un Kitabı 2, Duvaklama is the term used for covering something with something else. Duvaklama. Put, like putting a veil. Like preparing a Right. You caught it with a veil after all the other decorations, for example, makeup, hair, and so on. So that's called duvaklama, which literally translates it as putting a veil on. Older books have all these nice terms. And if we want to say sarma, we're not going to say dolma. We should say dolama at least because it's about uh, wrapping it. And if you cook rice with a, a Jewish style, you stir fry part of it and just like vermicelli, which results in a two-colored uh, rice. Uh, this is how we make it as well. And my mom used to make really nice kasır because she had uh, neighbors from Antakya. She, she used their style. So the more mixed, the better. The greater influence we have, the better it is. One of the questions we receive often is about uh, the um, the oven is it on fan? Yes, fan oven. Heat from below, and it, it's placed in the middle, uh, below and the, from the top, both of them. And as you can see, and the tray is placed in the middle of the oven. Uh, middle section, as you can see, I chopped the potatoes here. Well, we didn't peel the potatoes. I could we peel them? If you're going to make a puree, yes, but if not, well, sometimes I use potatoes water as well, the excess water as well. Uh, and my children tease with me, tease me in that I use everything. I use uh, apple for vinegar. I use the boiled water for my plants. Well, we need to trap the taste inside the potato. If you eat different types of potato, one peeled and another not peeled, you will see that if you don't peel it first, all the if you peel it first, uh, then the the entire taste goes into the water. In fact, there needs to be little water left once it's boiled. Then you mash it. If you want to make mashed potatoes, you can add milk or water or oil uh, well this is just potato boiled potato 
and we have salt and pepper here. And we will also smash some garlic with a little bit of salt. We need to pay respect to all the different types of um, ingredients we have here. Add in a little bit of sauce. I think this sauce goes with any type of materials, including boiled ones. I smashed the, the garlic, crushed the garlic with salt, and I add a little bit of mustard. Which type? I get ready-made, mild, hot, mild. I'll also squeeze some lemon. I will give the lemon a little bit of taste. This is like making mayonnaise. And I have an egg which I will cook a la coque. Now the fish uh, has cooked. I don't want it to go dry. I will take them. Well, in the other cook style, the yolk will be cooked. The rest will remain slightly cooked. We'll go back to our sauce now. Could use this sauce for boiled beans, broccoli, cauliflower, carrot, zucchini, any type of boiled vegetables, also chickpeas. Also for something we called radica, radica, that is radico. In our streets, my favorite view was places where uh, Roma sold flowers. In fact, in Istanbul's old neighborhoods, Kurtulish Pangal to Shishli, they still exist. Also in Taksim. Roma women sit there and they form a great view with their flowers in vases and when it's season they collect radico mallow in may they sell green fig they also sell nettle Well, I really like uh, buying radicos from flower, uh, flower florists and make a sauce with that. This sauce goes very well with all types of green herbs.
I'll add the homemade apple vinegar and the sauce goes really well with glass words as well. With sea beans. You're a wine person, I'm a vinegar person, I make vinegar at home. I can't accept throwing away the rest of peeled apple or the rest of what we eat. Fruits, I collect all that and I make vinegar. So we have salt and pepper added here. They absorbed all that. The potatoes like this sauce a lot. They absorb all the oil and the sauce and they shine. They're very bright. But that's not all. We just have 20 minutes left. I will rush and make sure that we finish in 20 minutes. I will chop a good amount of parsley. And the egg must have cook, been cooked. But I don't chop the parsley in really fine, in a fine way. You can see the leaves here. So it's not going to be so finely chopped. As you're doing that, I'll uh, respond to some of the questions we see here. Uh, one talked about, one of them talks about Oana Chan's book. Kebab etmek is a term used. In fact, kebab etmek is a term used for cooking. Adana kebab, Urfa kebab, and kebab place gained a new different meaning. But kebab etmek means cooking. And according to Nishayan's dictionary, its etymological origin is Arabic. And you asked about the wine selection, wine pairing as well. Well, we hear a lot about pairing white uh, wine with white colored food and red wine with red colored food uh, meat. Well, with, this is generally true. Here, uh, this would pair well with Narinje Tukat, white wine. But here we have mustard sauce and tomato as well. So a red wine uh, could be cooled, like Kaleji Karasu could be cooled and would go really well with, um, with this dish if it's not too accurate, like Kaleji and onion, you asked about the region that onions come from, uh, because you said Kurds like it a lot. If that's uh, a criterion, then I'm also Kurd. Well, I used to eat it full, uh, completely like an entire onion when I was little, and my son likes it a lot, only three. I can see uh, here uh, smell the smell of it. And in Takui's dishes, if you see the amount in recipes, maybe you would think it's a typo. For instance, uh, she would uh, include kilos of uh, onions in her recipes, and we like onions a lot. I cracked the egg and I stir it with a teaspoon. Still hot, the potatoes are still hot and I will pour in the egg on my potato, on the potatoes. Final touches. I think the egg again deserves some pepper, 
some black pepper, a little bit of salt, dry mint to give it more color, anything that goes with potatoes, just a little bit of red pepper, And I have parsley and tomatoes here, and I will pour in olive oil as it deserves. And here I have a mix of green and red, paprika. And a mixture of that with green and I will circle the salad with that and in fact my dad used to say the following and I remember that if you decorate me like this then I would be delicious too fetulat was a term he used But in fact, we don't often hear this word. It's used like an accessory to mean an accessory. But when I say this, I remember my dad and I just respond to my feelings. I miss him and it was hard to lose this person in my life it was very dynamic very lively only when i was when i was only 23 i wrote this book so friends shen also and i shared the things i love with my beloved children and if i did that i think i owe 80 percent of that to my dad until i was 17 he told me many things about our family's history. The history of Armenians. Armenians living in Torlu, Thrace. The history of Armenians, a history of 120 years. In fact, I learned uh, the concept of oral history only late. Uh, this was the routine in our house. We used to sit around the frame family table and as we ate my dad would start to talk first and foremost we would talk about what we would cook the next day and we would talk about who liked this food the most in the family and my dad would start to remember them Arda Sheya would like it. Topic. Patlıcan kebab would help us remember Kirkor uncle, Uncle Kirkor. And he would crush garlic. He liked rakı very much. He would crush garlic into the aubergine. And in fact, aubergine salad with garlic and rakı, I would recommend that. And we would also remember John as well when we were eating. In fact, we just wanted to commemorate people and eating, getting together at the table was about that. Or indeed, the smells of the food made him remember. And then he would share his memories about the family. She would share those stories with us at the table. My father, you mentioned a very nice thing, especially the last thing that you said, eating is not only about eating, we said, and we have only a few minutes, by the way, left, so maybe we should just repeat that. Eating makes you remember of other things, makes your mind work in other ways, and I know 
that the sense of smell is the least filtered place in our brain when we smell a smell when we sense a smell our memory just starts working a smell for example might make us remember of our father of a, a lost beloved person and i hope that we're going to be remembering you uh, today when we're reaching as well and your father as well this has been really enjoyable thank you very much and I hope that we'll be able to do this physically as well and get together physically too. Let's, uh, yes, I would love that. Would it be possible to see the fish as it is now? I couldn't really hear what you said. Could we see the fish as it is now, as it's cooked? Yes, of course, you can see it now. I at the moment would you like me to put it on a would you like me to put it on a put it on a plate as well so that i can um present it that way too but if i were eating it i would probably eat it from the tray itself directly we have five or six minutes left okay then i'm gonna put it in on a plate too i lost my father a little bit later but I don't think there is an early time or a late time to lose your father, as a matter of fact. And I am also calling my son as my, as my father would call after me. And it's like remembering him each time that I call after him. I believe that the words and food have that kind of a magic to them. And it is, of course, worth remembering. It's important to remember them. After our kitchen session is over, then we're going to be talking about hate speech and discrimination against LGBTI people, by the way. So if you can... And we're going to be talking about gender based dis discrimination in the main uh, session. So next to the fish, we should also have Rucola as well. And even if we don't like it, in order not to disrespect the fish, I hope, as I said earlier, Later on, I hope that we could repeat this activity. Looks very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. I'm always very keen to listen to you. I hope that we'll be able to do this again. And I'd like to thank the foundation, the Hunting Foundation as well, for giving us this opportunity. I'd like to thank the foundation too. The foundation is like a son or a daughter to me and of course a mother would want his want her daughter to be successful and i see the foundation and the personal at the foundation that way too i hope they're going to be much more successful i wish them more success and i'm really happy to see that they're doing very well and that's why i'm a very happy mother thank you very much for your kind words we uh, grow with you thanks to you Thank you very much. This was this has been really enjoyable. At quarter to two, we're going to start our next session. So see you there. Thank you very much again, uh, Takui and uh, Levon. Thank you very much.